13, Order M-179, Second Reading of Bill 179, an act to amend the Building Code Act 1992, the Insurance Act, and the Municipal Affairs Act in respect of flood avoidance, insurance, and recovery. Mr. Natasha. The member from Essex. Second Reading of Bill 179, an act to amend the Building Code Act 1992, the Insurance Act, and the Municipal Affairs Act in respect of flood avoidance, insurance, and recovery. Mr. Nanachak has moved second reading of Bill 179, an act to amend the Building Code Act 1992, the Insurance Act and the Municipal Affairs Act in respect of flood avoidance, insurance, and recovery. Pursuant to Standing Order 98, the member has 12 minutes for his presentation. I thank you very much, uh, Speaker. It is always an honor to rise uh, in this House, and particularly on an issue that uh, uh, is born out of frustration from my area of southwestern Ontario, Windsor and Essex County, and I think representative of uh, some measures of redress uh, on the part of our constituents. So uh, with that being said, I hope that uh, my colleagues in the House see merit in the bill because I think it has some effect that could be positive and uh, tangible and also a little bit of uh, uh, common sense. So, Speaker, with that, uh, the goal of this legislative regulatory uh, change in this bill is to ensure that Ontarians are supported by policy and programs when they endure property damage due to a natural disaster involving flooding. After two separate and severe weather events in late September of 2016 and in August of 2017, uh, local municipalities in my area declared states of emergency and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing activated the Ontario Disaster Re Recovery Program. Subsequently, our office, and I would imagine many other offices of members across the province, have been receiving numerous calls regarding both the private insurance and provincial programs that respond to uh, uh, measures of natural disasters. So in this bill uh, that we're debating today, I've attempted to address the most common frustrations that have been reported to our office. Firstly, uh, the recommendation, the first recommendation comes as a result of reports that insured property owners uh, that uh, were having their claims <clears throat> handled and then immediately cancelled or being advised by brokers that they should consider not filing the claim due to potential repercussions such as non-renewal. This is largely due to the fact that a large number of these claimants were also forced to file claims for basement flooding from both the severe rain events that I had er mentioned earlier. Uh, in the course of our investigations and research uh, of non-renewal, we spoke to the representative of the General Insurance Ombud Service, the GIO. The GIO reported that the industry uses, the insurance industry that is, uses what they refer to as the Habitation Information Tracking System, or HITS, as an acronym. Uh, this rec uh, records the history of all property insurance claims for each insured property in Ontario. So if a property has two similar claims within a three-year period, that policy is now deemed non-renewable. This further disadvantages uh, the homeowner because this information is available only uh, to all insurance providers. It is not available to the public in any form that we can find. It's, uh, it, having this information, Speaker, we believe would make it easier to verify whether or not claims following disasters are used against insured property owners. Uh, speaker, residents have also expressed complaints of being denied coverage under the Ontario Disaster Recovery Program. Uh, it, it was determined that uh, if it was determined that water entered through the municipal storm water sewer system, when the entire region is being inundated with heavy rainfall, the water uh, inevitably overwhelms all installed capacity, and the weak point for this speaker is often the storm wa sewer water system. So this is clearly not a fault of the residents, and we believe that coverage should also include sewer backup for all residential properties who otherwise qualify, qualify under the program and should not, should also, this is a uh, caveat as well, should also not be means tested, Speaker. Uh, thirdly, Speaker, I met with a group of students, some remarkable students at Holy Names uh, Grade School who have requested that, uh, and in my meeting with them, requested that I work with them to, uh, to find a solution that they're tasked with as a robotics team. They, this year, uh, the participants and the team, I want to give them a great shout out. Uh, I know they'll be watching the clip here. 
The Holy Names Robotics team is, is uh, coached by Mike Natalin and Mike Lamaru, and team members include Lucas Allison, Alyssa Burney, Lindsay Delaney, Emma Dunlop, Brianna McCarthy, Maddie Pierce, Lauren Schmidt, Emma Tellier, Elena Tuchuk, and Karina Tuchuk. So this year, Speaker, the theme of the robotics team through the first, uh, first robotics, LEGO first robotics uh, competition is to improve the way that people find, transport, use, or dispose of water. So for their project, they decided to focus on rainwater and how they can better utilize it. This led the team to uh, envisioning uh, the use of rain barrels in residential areas to divert uh, rainwater into our municipal system. So when I met with them, and I was just amazed by not only the robotics aspect, but their, uh, their problem solving techniques and the way they work together as a team, I said, you know, not only will I help you craft a, uh, a potential bill, but uh, I'm going to do you one better. I will uh, integrate it into this bill. And so, though, lo and behold, Speaker, this is uh, one of the provisions of the bill that I hope members uh, see some merit in. <clears throat> uh, the bill would require, it would change the, uh, the regulations around the building code, and it would require new builds to install, new residential builds to install at least a 209 uh, liter rain barrel. And, you know, in its, in its singularity, Speaker, on an individual basis, you would think that what would a rain barrel do to you know, uh, mitigate against flooding? Well, if we have this installed uh, as a collective throughout our communities, it has some serious potential, Speaker. The Insurance Bureau of Canada endorsed the use of rain barrels uh, when it conducted a pilot program in Prince Edward Island. Uh, they moved ahead uh, uh, and studied the, the use of old-fashioned rain barrels in communities and found uh, that uh, when they installed uh, close to a thousand rain barrels, they had the ability uh, to mitigate and uh, and and disperse about 4.5 percent of the flow rate of water that would normally enter into a treatment facility. It is quite a bit, and it's enough to potentially avoid catastrophic flooding for regions. So if you can imagine, um, you know, in, instead of, this is a hundred dollar solution, Speaker, on an individual basis, that could solve a multi-million dollar problem that all of our municipalities are struggling with. Uh, and wondering, you know, the, some municipalities have just installed new, uh, new water mains and new sewage uh, infrastructure, and yet, because of the intensity and frequency of rainwater and, and stormwater that we're seeing uh, entering into our communities due to climate change, due to the nature of, uh, of, of the changing climate, they are at, 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 uh, at, you know, uh, uh, at a point where they may have to dig up entire swaths of, of infrastructure to uh, put in larger pipes to be able to have that capacity. In my community of Lakeshore, Speaker, there was a motion passed uh, by Councillor Wilder and moved, uh, moved by Councillor Wilder uh, and seconded by Councillor uh, Janice that, uh, that, that called on the government uh, to uh, do something about this and to ensure that flood insurance programs cover individuals, families, businesses that are unable to secure flood insurance for their properties. Uh, speaker, the uh, third aspect uh, of the bill would be that under the Ontario uh, Disaster Relief Program that we have here, that responds to homeowners' needs in the case that their insurance fails to provide for them, uh, it, it doesn't cover uh, sewage backup. And that's something that we believe uh, has to happen because of the nature of the intensity of the floods. The minister uh, being questioned by my colleague, the member from Windsor Tecumseh, whose community was very heavily hit, uh, the Minister uh, of Municipal Affairs said that the program does cover sewage water backup. Well, it actually doesn't. It, uh, it doesn't cover it in, uh, in response to uh, a huge, again, swath of, of damage that's uh, catastrophic. And it is also means tested. So, uh, Speaker, we're saying that this is something that uh, people are looking for, something that could help them maintain home ownership and not be forced to move out of their communities. Uh, and something that we think is uh, is quite uh, quite um, reasonable, Speaker. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 
in the event of emergency, when the, when the government declares a state of emergency, people are being cut off by, by their insurance companies. Uh, this is regardless if they've ever had a claim. Some calls that we've received into our office are from folks that have lived in the same house in the same neighborhood for 30 and 40 years, have never had a claim on their home. Now, due to the intensity of, of storms in, uh, in our area and across the province, they've seen flooding like they've never seen before. And when they're poised to put a claim in, they're being told, don't put a claim in because you could potentially be cut off. Or after they put the claim in, they are then, their, their claim and their, their policy is canceled. We just fundamentally believe that this is not fair. Uh, what, it, what it does is it penalizes people for living in an area that they can't determine where this next uh, huge storm is going to happen. And also, Speaker, you, I'd, I'd ask my colleagues in the House to think about what this does to communities in the sense of uh, real estate value and livability. If you have an area that has been unfortunately hit by these, these, uh, these frequent storms and intense storms and has suffered flooding, and then whole neighborhoods have been, you know, their policies, have, their home uh, insurance policies have been canceled, that essentially makes that area unlivable. And that's certainly not the message that we want to send and, and, and the support that we need to provide for our communities. I think uh, this bill, uh, as pretty simple as it is, goes a long way to uh, mitigating our, uh, the effects of climate change on our communities. It puts some responsibility on, on new homeowners and, uh, and new builds to do their part to retain uh, storm water and to, you know, there's some, there's some also, also some benefits of retaining storm water. If you've got a garden or a lawn that you want to water, you've already captured, a, you know, some great, uh, some great rainwater from your roof and your east troughs to be able to water that. So there's some cost savings there. But uh, in, in, uh, in all respects, Speaker, I believe that this bill is uh, born out of fairness. It's born out of ingenuity from young leaders uh, in, in our communities who are going to be the next engineers and the next uh, uh, climate scientists who are looking for solutions. And it's a measure of also participatory democracy where we get good ideas from our community and it is our responsibility should we give, be given the opportunity to bring them forward. So I'm incredibly proud uh, to work with uh, the young people at Holy Names School in Essex and uh, hopefully, again, my colleagues will see the merits of this bill, push it through uh, the committee stage, let's talk about it. And, and, and I can't imagine that our response to our communities when it comes to flooding is that we can't do anything. Here's something that we can do and we'll go a long way to protecting homeowners in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Any further debate?